Hello my lovely Calimaris, this is Calimara here. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. We've got a big fish to fry today, a few announcements, and a lot of things I want to discuss. As you might have seen from the title and thumbnail, I'm going to be redesigning Hanako, the sister rival from Yendere Simulator. You did hear that right. She is your main love interest sister, and she is also a romantic rival. It may be written in a rather roundabout way in her description, but I think the implication here is pretty clear. Weird as it may seem, the Imoto trope is a fairly common one in the realm of Japanese media. There are shows and manga series out there where a brother and a sister end up loving each other very much, so I don't begrudge the game, which is centered around anime stereotypes, to include it. Do I think it has a deeper connotation for the developer of the game who chose to include that stereotype? No. I just think he's an edgy guy who really doesn't think too deeply about his game's characters and what the ramifications of their behaviors and actions are. And to be fair on him, in a sandbox game about killing people for no real reason like Yandere Simulator, you kind of have to. Which brings me to my first announcement. This video is going to omit the usual breakdown and discussion of the original Yandere Simulator concept, because if you're here, you're probably here for the Yansim content anyway and are already familiar with the sister concept and why it's messed up. Heck, you probably know more than me on what's happening in the Yansim sphere. Instead, I want to focus more on my take on the concept, what I want to do with the character, and the story I want to tell. I know that in my most recent videos, I've been focusing more on the former than I am on the latter. Which brings me to my second announcement. This is going to be my last Yansim redesign. I know some of you might be disappointed that I hadn't gotten to Asu, Osoro, or Megami, but that doesn't mean I won't redesign them at all. I just won't make videos specifically about them because, well, I don't really know as much about them, and from what I've seen, they don't have big glaring issues I really want to address. I also want to apologize for those of you who have been following along with my series and tuning in for the new story I've come up with. If you're wondering why I'm not making more Yansim redesign videos, the main reason is that I got a few criticisms in my Discord server recently that I felt were really valid, that really made me rethink things and reflect on what I've been doing so far. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but the bottom line is that those criticisms made me realize that making this series is hypocritical of me. I like to see myself as a mental health advocate, and yet I'm making content where the entire story and premise hinges on the woefully inaccurate portrayal and perceptions of antisocial personality disorders and psychosis to further the plot aka Yandere characters. We've spoken about and criticized a few character tropes on this channel, but the one trope we haven't touched on yet is arguably the most central and game-breaking of all, Yanderes. Now, I am someone who is very passionate about mental health, the study of health and diagnostic medicine in general. I've made a couple videos about mental health and when I started this channel, one of my goals was to share what I learned from my health degree with the general public, and that's why I arguably had the most fun redesigning the nurse. I wanted to clear up misinformation and stop the propagation of harmful portrayals of health conditions, but I can't do that while I'm writing a story that entirely banks on a character trope that is a misinformed and harmful portrayal of real-life mental health conditions suffered by real-life people. By removing the harmful, misinformed aspects of the character and 
attempting to correct them, you're no longer writing a yandere. And if you're no longer writing a yandere character, then it isn't a yandere story. Not one true to its name at least. So I've had to turn a blind eye to certain harmful aspects and excuse toxic behaviors for the hypothetical mechanics, but even then, I still had people commenting on my videos saying that you're meant to kill people and I'm pushing too hard for the pacifist route. And in an attempt to play up the whole crazy edginess of the concept, it just makes me cringe and I'm sure makes a lot of people cringe looking back on my original story now. And there are definitely things here and there I wish I did differently or left out entirely and I know this whole series is far from perfect. But do I regret making the series? No. It got me to where I am and put me in touch with so many passionate and creative people. I know that this series made my channel, so no matter how jank or edgy or cringy my videos were, they will always have a place in my heart and I want to continue to improve from them. Does that mean that people aren't allowed to make Yandere characters or stories? No, I'm just saying that I don't want to. And this isn't how I would have chosen to tell a story about mental illness because it doesn't align with how I see myself and what I want to be as a creator. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much I change, take away, or add, I'm still basing my content off a game and setting that I really don't enjoy or support anymore, which not only limits my creativity because I still have to abide by the rules and vibe of that setting, but it's also just a stupid thing to do. Plus, I feel that the story I am telling is reaching its natural resolution and this would be the perfect point to wrap things up. Does that mean that I won't do any other redesign videos? No, absolutely not. I have lots of other games and series that I actually like and enjoy and would much rather talk about. So I hope you'll stick around for that. The last announcement I want to make is that I'm going to go on hiatus for the next four weeks because I'm doing my last placement block and I wanted to use that break to close this chapter in my life and move on to other things when I come back. And with that, let's get into the redesign. For this redesign, I wanted Hanako to look more like an actual child instead of whatever this is, a, a preteen? I almost forgot preteens existed. I didn't know what it is about the original design that just doesn't sit right with me. Out of all the rivals, I just like her the least and I can't explain it. Maybe it's her hair, maybe it's her pose, her face, I just find it uncanny. I think it's the fact that this character looks like what an adult would look like if they were trying to dress up as a sexy schoolgirl for their partner. Like, they're acting cute and innocent, but you know why they're really dressed like that. That probably makes no sense, but that's the best explanation I can come up with. Either way, I decided to lean into that prompt of a cute little girl and just fully commit to it. I've mentioned it before in my senpai redesign that I wanted Hanako to look like an actual child and be an actual child because I think it gives her a stronger reason for why she's so dependent on her brother without making him weird. <laughs> Thus, I decided maybe she's still in primary school. In my personal storyline, Senpai is basically the only parental figure she has. He's the one helping her with her homework, making her lunches, washing her clothes, and doing all the cleaning. Their father is unreliable and absent, only coming home a few times a week and is hardly ever sober, and because of that, Senpai is the only person she trusts. My version of Hanako is timid and a crybaby who needs constant reassurance, but luckily for her, she has a big brother who wants nothing but the best for her and will do everything in his power to protect her and help her grow into a strong, independent woman. 
I've had a few people commenting that she looks like Marinette Dupain Chung from Miraculous Ladybug, and although that was completely unintentional, I definitely see where they were coming from. I just wanted to keep her twin tails because I felt like this should be the only time twin tails would suit the character, and it's a lot easier to tie than high twin tails, especially when you're a small child being raised by an older brother who knows nothing about hairstyling. My main inspiration for this design was actually Onion Cookie from the mobile game Cookie Run, which is one of my favorite game franchises ever. Onion Cookie is a precious cookie ghost child who weeps when she gets scared, but because her tears are made of onion juice, that makes her cry even more. I've been playing Cookie Run since it was still a line game and I really want to talk about this game at some point because I think they have the best character designs. My first uploads to this channel are actually Cookie Run fan art, so I feel like it makes sense I talked about it now that more people are actually playing the game and know what I'm talking about. Plus, Jeremy Shada, the voice actor for Finn from Adventure Time, voices Ginger Brave in Cookie Run Kingdom, and I never skip his dialogues because it makes the stories feel like an episode of Adventure Time. And if you're wondering if Cookie Run is sponsoring me, no they're not, but I would really like it if they did. But if you also play Cookie Run, let me know who your favorite cookie is. However, back to this three design, this Hanako doesn't trust easily and gets anxious in unfamiliar situations, which is why she will often be clinging onto her brother whenever they're together. Trigger warning for the mention of abuse and attempted not aliving here? Skip to this timestamp and keep yourself safe. Um, but essentially, her anxiety and mistrust are made all the worse when her father injured her in a drunken fit causing her to hit her head and lose consciousness, which was the final straw that pushed Senpai to get their father arrested and finally cut him out of their lives. She suffered a concussion and was hospitalized for weeks, drifting in and out of consciousness. The guilt drove Senpai to attempt the unspeakable, but he was saved when a neighbor decided to check in on him and he was sent to a hospital for treatment and later transferred to a psychiatric ward for further monitoring and counseling, which was where he met our protagonist. In the story presently, his sister has just been discharged from hospital with Seiya, aka Senpai, as her legal guardian. Although her physical injuries have healed, her trauma still needs time to resolve. Thus, she still frequently attends counseling sessions at her local health clinic. I decided to call her Yui because I think it's an adorable name and which really suits her as a character. And she is also an important plot character that we meet after the nurses week because for Senpai's surprise that I mentioned in that video, he invites you to spend the mid-autumn festival with them and she is also not a killable character. Given that the Northern Hemisphere is currently in the peak of autumn, I thought this would suit the current vibe that's going around. One thing I have been meaning to improve on is doing more research into local festivals and traditions in Japan rather than just transposing Western culture into the setting. Because although those influences do exist, it takes on a completely different meaning and significance that might not align as accurately with its origin. Halloween is one of those holidays. In Japan, it's mostly an excuse for teenagers and young adults to cosplay and party the night away with less emphasis on trick-or-treating, which isn't really even a thing, or the spooky scary stories. It's actually not as popular with children like it is in the US. And because of that, I chose to have them attend the Mid-Autumn Festival or Tsukimi instead, which is a moon viewing festival where people give offerings such as seasonal produce to the autumn moon where people of all ages can attend. So how does this story unfold? Well, I mentioned in my previous video that I initially wanted to do a light novel concept for this story. I still do, but 
maybe as a completely original story separate from the structure of Yandere Simulator or Yandere's in general. To show you guys what I intend to do, I've written the implementation of this concept like a chapter in a light novel, as well as an animatic I made for the good ending, so make sure you watch all the way to the end. Falling composed the instrumentals and mixed the vocals together, and I'm so grateful to be able to work with him. Go and check out his channel, they make awesome music. But without further ado, let's get on with story time with Callie. The vision of happiness had never been clearer for Ayano than it was in that moment. Ayano, that wasn't even her real name, just another mask she had put on to try and belong in this world. His world. The real Ayano was likely somewhere in Europe, sightseeing and doing whatever she wanted while her imposter slaved away at her assignments and exams, saving face and mingling and making her seem like a model student. All of her, from the clothes she wore to the words she spoke, were full of lies and deceit. All the friends she had made, the people that had come to trust her, they were enthralled by Ayano's words, Ayano's charm, and Ayano's wealth. They were there for Ayano, supporting her, thinking they knew her and listening to her when she faltered, when she was not quite Ayano. Not knowing that she was lying to their face the entire time, because she was not Ayano. She was a scared, lost little girl chasing after shadows and ghosts that she knew deep down she could never grasp. Yet she chased them anyway, because it had never been about grasping that goal. It was a thrill of the chase, the hope that those ghosts would grant her impossible wishes. Yes, for the first time in her life, she had hoped that things could get better, a glimmer of light among heavy storm clouds, and she chased that light no matter where it took her. For the time being, it had remained still long enough for her to bask underneath it, to feel its warmth on her cold, damp skin. She was full of hope the moment Seiya asked her to meet him after school at the courtyard. She told herself impossible promises when she went to see him, that he would ask her to be his girlfriend and everything will be worth it. All her pain and mental anguish would finally go away. She would finally become a normal person who could live a normal, happy life. Once she was his girlfriend, she could leave her past behind. She would no longer be afraid and everything would be okay. The day's events were completely forgotten when she went to see him, but not before she received endless teasing from Reika. Mayumi, Izumi, and Nico. Even her visit to the nurse's office had been tolerable. He was as bright as the sun to her, nearly blinding her with his brilliant as he stood there at the courtyard. He stood tall and proud, his face stoic, but his eyes lost in thought, just like it always was. Seiya was the kind of person who had a hundred things on his mind, always. Always so worried. Yet, somehow, he manages to push forward anyway. That was who he was, and that was only one of the reasons why she admired him so. Senpai! she exclaimed, grabbing his attention immediately and drawing a soft smile onto his face. Yo, he nods, raising his end up to greet her. That hand soon came to rest on the back of his neck, and his smile turned into a playful smirk. You sure took your time, sunshine. I've got places to be, you know. At his teasing, how could she do anything but giggle? Especially when he was using the nickname he gave her at their first meeting. She hadn't been so cheerful then, and he had picked that name specifically because of her gloominess. Names were wishes, after all. A hope for what the person would become. 
Well, it's not easy being popular. People just won't leave me alone, she teased back, grinning broadly, earning a playful ruffle on the top of her head by his large, calloused hand. All right, prima donna. We gonna walk home or what? It was not often Seiya would walk her home from school. It had only taken her once or twice so far. The Aishis lived in a wealthy, gated neighborhood. They had a security checkpoint at the entrance, and only residents were allowed inside. That was where she liked to part ways, waiting until he was out of sight before beginning her real journey home, and she would walk with a smile on her face the entire way. She loved the impossible promises he represented, but more and more she found herself loving the conversations and laughter they shared, the quiet understanding. Being able to know for a fact that out of everyone in that school, he was the only one who knew her for her, not for Ayano. Her identity at school and her difficult past, he knew her at her absolute worst, yet he still smiled when he was around her. He made her feel as though she wasn't so alone. But this particular walk home was different to the walks they've had before. There was a heavy silence that she wasn't sure she should break. It was the oh-so-familiar pause of someone wanting to say something important to you, but they haven't found the right way of saying it yet. She couldn't help but wonder if there was something wrong, and he was trying to find the kindest way possible to tell her to piss off. But luckily, the silence broke, and Seiya spoke. I know you've been going through some stuff these last couple of weeks. Oh no. He noticed that? Nervously, she asked him, What do you mean? He answers, Well, I apologize if it's not my place to say, but you seem really stressed out and you've been avoiding people a lot lately. And you had that panic attack too. A twitching of her hand, her eyelids. It was difficult. She thought she could do it, but it was difficult to lie and pretend and convince yourself thoroughly that this role you're playing, this person you're pretending to be, was who you really were. But that was her goal, wasn't it? She wanted to be this person. This perfect model citizen that everyone loved, that led a perfectly normal life. In a way... She had fulfilled one of her impossible wishes already. She was exactly who she wanted to be, and yet, she still wasn't happy. In fact, she was only getting worse. That weight in her mind was getting heavier and heavier. But more than that, there was a new weight on her chest that she could not get rid of, no matter what she did. The weight was too much for her being to carry, and her cracks were beginning to show. The lie that had been so intricately woven, beginning to unravel, and she was the weak link. Oh. A pause, then a weak, defeated smile. The girls told you, didn't they? Yeah, he admits. So, do you want to talk about it? Not really. A typical answer for her. He sighs softly. (sighs) Yeah, I thought so. He takes a long stride forward, then turns on his heel to face her, walking backwards as he continues. That's why I'm inviting you to Tsukimi with me and my sister. The rest of the walk home went by in a blur. She had said yes even before her brain fully processed it. All she heard was that he was asking her out on a date, and that was enough. But as she sat at her desk late into the night, completing assignments for two different schools, one she was meant to attend and one she was attending for someone else, she thought back about what he had said, and she realized he had a sister. He'd never once mentioned a sister before. She didn't even know he had a sister. Were they close? How old was she? 
she a younger sister or an older sister? She realized that there was actually very little she knew about him outside of his school life. Not to mention, she still didn't even know why he... Her hand faltered in the middle of the sentence she was writing. Well, she would just have to wait until he was ready to tell her. The weekend arrived entirely too soon, and with it, Tsukimi. She wore her best kimono and put on the lipstick and mascara Izumi had lent her. Her uncle had gone out with his workmates. She told him she was staying home to study. He was disturbingly easy to convince. She walked to the festival grounds where various stalls and lanterns had been set up. There were pampas grass as far as the eye could see, and she waited at the shrine where they promised to meet. She knew it wasn't really a date. How could it be if he was bringing his sister along? A part of her was upset. Why did she have to intrude on their time alone? Didn't this sister have anything better to do? How clingy can you get? tagging along with your brother for a festival. Hopefully she meets up with her friends and leaves them alone. But all of her thoughts melted away as soon as she spotted him in his navy kimono. He had changed his black stud to sapphire and it matched his ocean blue eyes. He was perfect. This was perfect. But then, next to him she spotted a little girl perhaps barely out of primary school, looking rather terrified as she held his hand. She was small and frail. The top of her head barely reached her brother's waist, and she was spooked by anyone and everyone that wandered too close. She hated the crowd. She could tell right away. Seiya spotted her not long after, and once again called out to her. Yo! She waved back at him, and for a moment, she thought she saw the faintest hint of a blush on his face. They approached her, and Seiya gently pulled the little girl forward. She wanted to keep hiding behind her brother, though. This is my sister, Yui. She's turning eight next year, so she's pretty much a big girl now. Yui, this is Ayano Aishi, the friend I was telling you about. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Miss Haishi, Yui said quietly. Call me Aya, she says swiftly, bending down to her eye level. She had grown to hate being referred to by the name Ayano, but Aya was a bit easier for her to accept. At least then it had some connection to her, because she had chosen that name for herself. It's nice to meet you, Yui. They gave their offerings to the moon and spent the rest of the night eating tsukimi dango and udon noodles. They watched the traditional song and dance performances and they played the booth games that had been set up. Aya had never done any of that before, but being with Seiya and Yui, she felt as though she was a part of something. A family. Though Yui had initially been wary and shy around her, she slowly began to come closer and speak to her directly instead of asking Seiya to tell her as the night went on. Aya found herself observing Yui more than she did Seiya. There was something about her that felt both uncanny and frustrating. The way she looked at the world and how she teared up at the smallest things. How scared she was all the time. She reminded her a lot of herself. It was almost as if she was looking into a mirror and it resonated with something inside of her. A long forgotten part that had been hidden away. But unlike her, she didn't have anyone holding her hand through it all. Maybe that was why Seiya had gravitated towards her in the first place. Perhaps he saw that she was how his sister would have turned out without him. When Yui reached out and held her hand for the first time that night, Something stirred inside her chest, a warmth that she had only felt with Seiya so far. She could never figure out what it is, and all that time she had only been focused on feeling more of it more often. By 10 o'clock, 
they decided to sit on one of the shrine benches and watch the full autumn moon. Yui had fallen asleep on Seiya's lap, his haori draped over her as a blanket. She's been through a lot lately. I wanted to take her out to do something nice, Seiya said softly, as to not wake her. He turned his head to Aya, then smirked teasingly. Kind of like someone else I know. Aya smiled softly back at him, shaking her head. After a pause, she responded. Thank you for inviting me. I had fun. I'm glad to hear it, he nodded. His tone was different this time, and it beckoned her to pay attention. Although, I have to apologize for using you a bit. I thought it would be a good idea to have Yui meet someone who gets it. She doesn't have any friends at school, so I wanted her to meet you. Do you hate me? If there was anyone that should be apologizing for using someone, it should have been her. And yet, here he was, looking at her with genuine concern on his face that she might hate him. Aya shook her head firmly. Of course not. She paused, then gently asked, But what do you mean, someone who gets it? He hesitated, but something in his eyes told her that it was a story he was determined to tell, no matter how difficult. She just got out of the hospital, too. She hated it there. Aya's eyes widened. Was that why she felt such a strong connection with her? What happened? Seiya let out a sigh, his breath misting in the cold night air. Yeah, she, she got into an accident. She got a concussion and for a long time she wasn't waking up. Aya heard the sudden tightening of his voice and she placed her hand over his, squeezing it tightly. He turned his hand over and grasped hers back turning her face a soft shade of red. But he continued. That was why I ended up as an inpatient, too. Her eyes glanced to the base of his neck where his scar sat, barely visible from the collar of his kimono. It all made perfect sense now. She was hospitalized for a while. She couldn't go to school or play with the other kids. And she was constantly surrounded by nurses and social workers and counselors. A lot of strangers, you know. I'm the only family she's got left. Aya felt quiet, the realization dawning on her and weighing heavily on her mind. Her gaze drifted to the small child sleeping on her brother's lap. When I met you, you made me realize that I had to live on if only for her sake. I couldn't leave her alone. His hand tightened around hers, and Aya lifted her gaze to look at him. His eyes were shining brighter than the moon and the stars combined. You saved my life, sunshine. Seiya, I... She couldn't do it anymore. Her barriers, her masks were breaking apart. Tears were spilling clouding her vision and trickling down her cheeks. That feeling she had felt this entire time. It was the feeling that she was loved, that someone out there would miss her if she were gone, that she was seen and she existed in this world. And people, regardless of who they think she was, they loved her, they saw her, her name, didn't change the experiences they shared, the laughter, the hugs, the tears. They were all there for her, not Ayano. And she realized that she had stopped pretending a long time ago. And after everything they've done for her, it was time that she earned all of their love, their trust, the right way. I've been lying to you. The truth is... If 
Get you.